Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. After living in my small town house for the past three years, I'm dealing with the neighbor from hell, and I need to vent about this ridiculous situation. Some background. I saved up for years to buy this place. It's nothing fancy, but it's mine. And one of its best features is the small driveway that fits my car perfectly. I work from home most days, but I also have regular client meetings, so having guaranteed parking is essential for my work life. The townhouse next door was vacant for the first two years I lived here, but six months ago, my new neighbor moved in. At first, she seemed nice enough. Just a woman in her 40s who worked at some local business. The only downside to her unit is that it doesn't have a driveway, so she has to park on the street like most other residents in the area. Everything was fine for the first month. Then one evening, I heard a knock at my door. When I opened it, my neighbor politely explained that she was having friends over for dinner and the street parking was completely full. She asked if she could use my driveway just for the night promising to move her car first thing in the morning. I hesitantly agreed, saying it wouldn't be a problem just this once. She seemed so grateful, and I thought nothing of it. But that's when things started to go downhill. A week later, I came home from grocery shopping to find her car in my driveway again. I had to park on the street carrying my groceries from half a block away. When I went to talk to her about it, she answered the door with this annoyingly casual attitude. I pointed out that her car was in my driveway again, and she casually explained that it was street cleaning day and she didn't want to move her car twice. She claimed she knew I wouldn't mind since I had let her use it last time. When I told her that I actually did mind because I needed to park there, she dismissed my concern saying she'd be heading out in an hour anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. Before I could respond, she just closed the door. I stood there dumbfounded. After that, it became a regular thing. Every week, I'd find her car in my driveway for different reasons. Sometimes it was because of street cleaning, other times because she had groceries to unload, or because it was raining, or because she was just running inside for a minute. I tried being firm with her multiple times. Once I directly told her she needed to stop parking in my driveway without asking, she brushed me off saying that since I was always working from home anyway, my car barely moved. When I explained that it was my driveway and I needed to be able to use it whenever I needed to, she accused me of being uptight and insisted that neighbors should help each other out. But the real breaking point came last Tuesday. I had an important client meeting downtown at 9 a.m. I walked out to my car at 8.15, plenty of time to make it, only to find her car blocking mine in the driveway. I knocked on her door repeatedly, but no answer. I called the number she'd given me for emergencies straight to voicemail. Finally, at 8.40, she casually strolls out her front door with a coffee cup in hand. I immediately told her I needed to leave for a meeting and that I'd been trying to reach her for 25 minutes. She brushed it off with a casual apology, saying she was in the shower and didn't hear me. Then had the nerve to add that I usually don't leave this early. When I explained that it didn't matter and that she couldn't block my car in because I was going to be late for an important client meeting, she got defensive. She complained that I was being unneighborly and that she'd had a rough morning and I was just making it worse. Then she threatened to talk to the homeowners association about my selfish behavior regarding the driveway. That's when I'd had enough. I went straight to my security camera footage which I'd installed after the third unauthorized parking incident and compiled a month's worth of clips showing her repeatedly using my driveway without permission. I sent everything to the homeowners association myself along with a detailed complaint. I also called a towing company and arranged to have them on speed dial. The next time she parked in my driveway, which was just two days later, I had her car towed without warning. She came pounding on my door an hour later absolutely livid. She demanded to know how I dared to have her car towed and asked if I knew how much it would cost her. I calmly told her that I did know the exact cost, as the towing company had been very specific about their fees. 
I also told her that I had written documentation of asking her multiple times not to park there, plus video evidence of every time she'd done it anyway. I warned her that if she parked in my driveway again, I'd have her car towed again, and if she kept harassing me about it, my next call would be to the police. She went ballistic, screaming about how terrible I was and how she'd make sure everyone in the neighborhood knew what an awful person I am. But I just closed the door and let her rant. It's been two weeks now and she hasn't parked in my driveway since. She still glares at me every time she sees me, and I heard from other neighbors that she's been telling everyone I'm the neighbor from hell. But my driveway has remained blissfully empty, except for my own car, and that's all I wanted in the first place. Three years ago, I inherited this beautiful 50-acre property from my grandfather. It's got everything. A lake, some woods, and amazing spots for camping. The problem started almost immediately after I moved in. People from the nearby town kept trespassing to camp here, claiming they've always done this when my grandfather owned the place. Here's the thing. My grandfather was too nice and let a few locals camp occasionally. But after he passed away, it seemed like the whole town decided my property was their personal campground. Every weekend, I'd find new people setting up tents, leaving trash everywhere, and some even had the audacity to complain about the facilities. Whenever I confronted them, telling them this was private property and they needed to leave, they'd always give me the same response. They'd argue that they'd been camping there for years. When I explained that things were different now and I wasn't comfortable with strangers camping on my property, they'd call me selfish, pointing out there was plenty of space. This conversation repeated itself almost every weekend. I put up no trespassing signs. They ignored them. I installed cameras. They vandalized them. I called the police. They'd leave before officers arrived and come back the next day. The final straw was when a group left their campfire unattended and it almost spread to my cabin. That's when I decided enough was enough. I invested in a serious security system, including an electrical fence. Not the kind that kills, just enough voltage to make someone regret their choices. I put up warning signs every 20 feet. Danger. Electric fence in bright red letters. I even added pictures of lightning bolts for those who don't like reading. Then came this woman, let's call her Karen, who will become the star of this story. I was having my morning coffee when my security system alerted me to movement at the fence. Through the camera feed, I watched this woman in outdoor gear examining my fence. She had one of those expensive camping sets that people buy to look outdoorsy on social media. I grabbed my phone to record for legal reasons and headed out. When I approached, I overheard her phone conversation. She was complaining to someone about the electric fence, mocking whoever had installed it and declaring it wouldn't stop her from using her favorite Instagram spot. Her friend tried to interject with what sounded like a warning, but Karen dismissed it, claiming that warning signs were just for show and that nobody actually electrified fences anymore. I announced my presence by confirming that I did, in fact, electrify the fence and pointed out she was trespassing. She jumped slightly, then demanded to know who I was. When I identified myself as the property owner and told her to leave, she became indignant, insisting this had been public camping land for decades and that I couldn't fence it off. I corrected her, explaining this had never been public land and that she wasn't welcome here. She scoffed and declared that her 3,000 followers were expecting a sunrise yoga session by the lake, and she wouldn't disappoint them. I warned her that the only thing her followers would see would be her getting zapped if she touched the fence. She tried to intimidate me with threats of lawsuits if the fence hurt her. I responded by pointing to my phone, explaining I was recording everything, including my warnings about the electrified fence, and reminded her about the signs every 20 feet. She just rolled her eyes and dismissed my warning. Then, this brilliant woman decided to prove her point. She grabbed her expensive camping gear, took a few steps back, and tried to jump over the fence. Keyword, tried. The moment she touched the wire, the fence did exactly what it was designed to do. The shock wasn't dangerous, but it was enough to make her yelp and fall backward onto her backpack. Her phone went flying one way, her camera another. 
She started screaming about how I had actually electrified the fence and threatened to call the police. I encouraged her to do exactly that, saying, I'd love to show them the video of her ignoring multiple warning signs and attempting to trespass despite being explicitly warned not to. She scrambled to gather her scattered belongings, most of which were now broken, all while alternating between threats of lawsuits and creative cursing. Her expensive camping gear was scattered across the ground, and her phone screen was shattered. She made one final threat about calling her lawyer, insisting I couldn't do this to people. I calmly explained that I could, in fact, protect my property this way, and offered to replay the video of my multiple warnings. She finally limped away, her outdoor outfit now covered in dirt, her social media dreams thoroughly zapped. The police did show up later that day. Apparently, she actually called them. They reviewed my security footage, checked my permits for the fence, and ended up giving her a warning for attempted trespassing. A few days later, I found out she had indeed posted about the incident on social media, not for her sunrise yoga session, but to warn others about the crazy person with the electric fence. It backfired spectacularly when people in the comments pointed out that she was the one trespassing on private property and ignoring clear warning signs. My property has been remarkably trespasser-free since then. Apparently, nothing deters entitled campers, quite like the story of a social media influencer getting zapped mid-jump. I work in real estate, which means I know exactly how annoying unsolicited calls about buying houses can be. It's like being a chef and having someone constantly try to tell you how to cook. After 15 years in the business, I've developed a pretty good nose for scams, and these random calls asking to buy my house started setting off all kinds of alarms. At first, I tried to be polite. I really did. But when you're getting three to four calls a day from people claiming to be from Home Builders Incorporated or some other vague company name, your patience starts wearing thin. What really got me was how they had all my information, address, property details, everything. As someone who deals with private property information daily, I knew this wasn't right. One slow afternoon, I decided to do some digging. After a few hours of research, I managed to track down the actual owner of one of these company names they were using. He turned out to be a legitimate businessman from Minnesota, who was just as frustrated as I was about these scammers using his company's name. When I called him, I explained about the constant calls I was receiving from people claiming to be from his company. He immediately guessed they were trying to buy my house, showing he was familiar with the situation. When I confirmed this, he revealed the truth. There was a company in Egypt selling American sales leads, circumventing legal issues by combing through public records. He then offered to teach me how to catch them. He explained that if I pretended to be interested, I could get connected to the actual American companies buying these illegal leads. It was like being handed the keys to the kingdom of petty revenge. I played along with the next call I got, gave them some wrong information, just plausible enough to seem real. Sure enough, a few days later, I got a call from someone in Northern Ohio. When I confronted him about how he got my information, he claimed ignorance. When I mentioned the Egyptian company and pointed out the illegality of his actions, he hung up immediately and blocked my number. But I wasn't done. I called from different numbers until he eventually had to disconnect his line entirely. Small victory, but it wasn't enough to stop the calls completely. That's when I discovered my true calling, professional telemarketer troller. I developed quite the repertoire. I would turn the tables and ask to buy their house instead, catching them completely off guard. When they tried to redirect the conversation, I would ask them about the pyramids and tourism in Egypt. They never seemed to appreciate my interest in their local landmarks. Sometimes I would answer pretending to be Mario's Pizza. When they tried to explain they weren't calling about pizza, I would cheerfully put them on hold for our catering department. I'd leave them waiting timing how long they'd stay on the line. My record was 12 minutes, but my masterpiece came when one caller asked if I had any other properties to sell. The setup was perfect. 
When they asked about other properties, I told them about my lovely property at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, District of Columbia. When they asked for more details, I described it as having a gorgeous, fully fenced yard, tons of bedrooms, a beautiful oval-shaped office, and the best security system in the country. Two days later, my phone rang. The first caller couldn't stop laughing, telling me how brilliant I was and wondering how I managed to convince them I owned the White House. We shared a good laugh before hanging up. An hour later, another caller was less amused, demanding to know why he got a sales lead on the White House. When I explained that this is what happens when you buy illegal sales leads from people in Egypt who don't know American landmarks, he grew angry. He insisted it wasn't funny, to which I replied that I found it hilarious since he'd wasted money on a useless lead and I was now wasting his time. After telling me to go F myself, I cheerfully offered to sell him Mount Rushmore instead, mentioning the spectacular views. He hung up in frustration. I wasn't done, though. I started calling their office daily, each time with a new famous property to sell. The Empire State Building, the Golden Gate Bridge, Disneyland. I had an endless supply of properties to sell. Eventually, their company shut down their entire operation in my area. Turns out, when you flood scammers with fake leads, it hurts their bottom line. Who knew? Last I heard, they had to lay off half their staff because their success rate had dropped so low. I'd like to think my White House listing had something to do with that. These days, I still get calls occasionally, but now they're from different companies. That's okay, though. I've got a whole list of national monuments I'm willing to part with for the right price. My sister was always the wild one while I focused on building my career in software development. When she had her kids, I was thrilled to be an aunt. During her divorce two years ago, I even let her stay at my place for three months while she got back on her feet. That's probably where things went wrong. Working from home, she saw how flexible my schedule could be, but she didn't understand that flexible didn't mean free. The unannounced visit started six months ago. What began as occasional visits became almost daily interruptions. The final straw came during a crucial video meeting when she burst in with her kids, saying she needed to run errands. Before I could protest, she was gone, leaving her children pulling books off my shelves and climbing on my desk. I had to reschedule my meeting and when she returned four hours later, not the promise to, my house was in chaos. Juice stains marked my carpet, crayon decorated my walls, and somehow sticky handprints had found their way to my ceiling fan. When I tried to set boundaries, explaining that these surprise visits during work hours had to stop, she accused me of being selfish and threw the single mom card at me. I snapped reminding her of all I'd done to help, the rent-free housing, constant babysitting, and financial support. This wasn't support anymore. It was taking advantage. She stormed out, threatening I wouldn't see the kids again. The next day, she posted on social media about fake family and selfish people who don't care about children. I responded publicly, detailing everything I'd done to help her. Our friends and family backed me up, some sharing similar stories of her, dumping her kids on them without warning. A week later, she showed up, this time knocking, with an apology. She admitted she'd gotten too comfortable using me as her backup plan. We worked out a proper schedule. She now calls two days in advance for help and respects my work hours. Sometimes I still say no and that's okay. Best of all, my walls are finally crayon-free. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.